Gotta get this cactus, smiling cactus in here. Hey guys. So today I'm gonna do a short story that a subscriber requested for me on one of my earlier videos. Thank you, Tala. I appreciate the request. Today I will be reading Catch the Moon by Judith Ortiz Kofer. All right, with that said, let's dive in. Catch the Moon. Louis Cintron sits on the top of a six foot pile of hubcaps and watches his father walk away into the steel jungle of his car junkyard. Released into his old man's custody, after six months in Juvenile Hall, for breaking and entering, and he didn't even take anything. He did it on a dare. But the old lady with a million cats was a light sleeper, and good with her aluminum cane. He has a scar on his head to prove it. Now Luis is wondering whether he should have stayed in and done his full time. Jorge Cintron of Jorge Cintron and Son Auto Parts in Salvaje had decided that Luis should wash and polish every hubcap in the yard. The hill he is sitting on is only the latest couple of hundred wheel covers that have come in. Luis grunts and stands up on top of his silver mountain. He yells at no one. Someday, son, all this will be yours. And sweeps his arms like the Pope, blessing a crowd over the pile of car sandwiches and mounds of metal parts that cover this acre of land outside the city. He is the son of Jorge Cintron, and son. And so far his father has had more than one reason to wish it was plain Jorge Cintron on the sign. Luis has been getting in trouble since he started high school two years ago, mainly because of the social group he organized, a bunch of guys who were into harassing the local authorities. Their thing was taking something to limit on a dare, or... Better still, doing something dangerous, like breaking into a house, not to steal, just to prove that they could do it. This was Luis's specialty, coming up with very complicated plans, like military strategies, and assigning the jobs to guys who wanted to join the Tiburones. Tiburon means shark, and Luis had gotten the name from watching an old movie about a Puerto Rican gang called the Sharks with his father. Luis thought it was one of the dumbest films he had ever seen. Everybody sang their lines, and the guys all pointed their toes and leaped in the air when they were supposed to be slaughtering each other. But he liked their name, The Sharks. So he made it Spanish and had it air painted on his black t-shirt with a killer shark under it. Jaws open wide and dripping with blood. It didn't take long for the other guys in the barrio to ask about it. Man had they had a good time. The girls were interested too. Luis outsmarted everybody by calling his organization a social club and registering it at Central High. That meant they were legal, even let out of last period class on Fridays for their club meetings. It was just this year, after a couple of botched jobs, that the teachers had started getting suspicious. The first one to go was when he sent Kenny Matoa to borrow some souvenirs out of Anito Robles' rocker. He got caught. It seems that Matoa had been reading Anita's diary and didn't hear her coming down the hall. Anita was supposed to be in the gym at that time, but had copped out with the usual female excuse of cramps. You could hear his screams all the way to Market Street. She told the principal all she knew about the Tiburones, and Luis had to talk fast to convince Mr. Williams that the club did put on cultural activities such as the Save the Animals talent show. What Mr. Williams didn't know was that the animal was being saved with the ticket sales was Lewis's pet boa, which needed quite a few live mice to stay healthy and happy. They kept ES, which stood for Endangered Species, in Luis's room. But he belonged to the club, and it was the members' responsibility to raise the money to feed their mascot, so last year they had sponsored their first annual Save the Animals talent show, and it had been a great success. The Tipugones had come dressed as Latino Elvises and did a grand finale to All Shook Up that made the audience go wild. Mr. Williams had smiled while Luis talked, maybe remembering how the math teacher, Mrs. Laguna, had dragged him out in the aisle to rock and roll with her. 
Luis had gotten out of that one, but barely. His father was a problem, too. He objected to the t-shirt logo, calling it disgusting and vulgar. Mr. Sin Chuan prided himself on his own neat, elegant style of dressing after work, and on his manners and large vocabulary, which he picked up by taking correspondence courses in just about everything. Luis thought that it was just his way of staying busy since Luis's mother had died, almost three years ago, of cancer. He had never gotten over it. All this was going through Luis's head as he slid down the hill of the hubcaps. The tub full of soapy water, the can of polish, and the bag of rags that had been neatly placed in front of a makeshift table made from two car seats and a piece of plywood. Luis heard a car drive up and someone honk their horn. His fathers emerged from inside a new red Mustang that had been totaled. He usually dismantled every small feature by hand before sending the vehicle into the cementerio, as he called the lot. Luis watched as the most beautiful girl he had ever seen climb out of the vintage white Volkswagen bug. She stood in the sunlight in a white sundress waiting for his father, while Luis stared. She was like a smooth wood carving. Her skin was mahogany, almost black, and her arms and legs were long and thin, but curved in places so that she did not look bony and hard, more like a ballerina and her ebony hair was braided close to her head. Luis let his breath out, feeling a little dizzy. He had forgotten to breathe. Both the girl and his father heard him. Mr. Cintron waved him over. Luis, the senorita here has lost a wheel cover. Her car is 25 years old, so it will not be an easy match. Come look on this side. Luis tossed a wrench he'd been holding into a toolbox like he was annoyed, just to make a point about slave labor. Then he followed his father, who knelt on the gravel and began to point out every detail of the hubcap. Luis was hardly listening. He watched the girl take a piece of paper from her handbag. Senor Cintron, I have drawn the hubcap for you. Since I will have to leave soon, my home address and telephone number are here, and also my parents' office number. She handed the paper to Mr. Cintron, who nodded. See, si, senorita. Very good. This will help my son look for it. Perhaps there is one in that stack there. He pointed to the pile of caps that Luisa was supposed to wash and polish. Yes, I'm almost certain that there is a match there. Of course, I do not know if it's near the top or the bottom. You will give us a few days, yes? Luisa stared at his father like he was crazy but he didn't say anything because the girl was smiling at him with a funny expression on her face. Maybe she thought he had x-ray eyes like Superman, or maybe she was mocking him. Please, call me Naomi, Senor Cintron. You know my mother. She is the director of the funeral home. Mr. Cintron seemed surprised at first. He prided himself on having a great memory. Then his friendly expression changed to one of sadness as he recalled the day of his wife's burial. Naomi did not finish her sentence. She reached over and placed her hand on Mr. Cintron's arm for a moment. Then she said, Adios, softly, and got in her shiny white car. She waved to them as she left, and her gold bracelets flashing in the sun nearly blinded Luis. Mr. Cintron shook his head. How about that? He said as if to himself. They are the Dominican owners of Ramirez's funeral home. And, with a sigh, she seems like such a nice young woman. Reminds me of your mother when she was her age. Hearing the funeral parlor's name, Luis remembered too. The day his mother died, he had been in a room at the hospital while his father had gone for coffee. The alarm had gone off on our monitor and nurses had come running in, pushing them outside. After that, all he recalled was the anger that had made him punch a hole in his bedroom wall, and after he had refused to talk to anyone at the funeral. Strange, he did see a black girl there who didn't try, like the others, to talk to him, but actually ignored him as she escorted family members to the viewing room and brought flowers in. Could it be that the skinny girl in a frilly white dress had been Naomi? 
She didn't act like she had recognized him today, though. Or maybe she thought that he was a jerk. Luis grabbed the drawing from his father. The old man looked like he wanted to walk down memory lane. But Luis was in no mood to listen to the old stories about his falling in love on a tropical island. The world they'd lived in before he was born wasn't his world. No beaches and palm trees here. Only junk as far as he could see. He climbed back up his hill and studied Naomi's sketch. It had obviously been done very carefully. It was signed, Naomi Ramirez, in the lower right hand corner. He memorized the telephone number. Luis watched hubcaps all day until his hands were red and raw but he did not come across the small silver bowl that would fit in the VW. After work, he took a few practice frisbee shots across the yard before showing his father what he had accomplished. Rows and rows of shiny rings are drying in the sun. His father nodded and showed him the bump on the temple where one of Luis's flying saucers had gotten him. Practice makes perfect, you know. Next time, you'll probably decapitate me. Luis heard him struggle with the word, Decapitate, which Mr. Cintron pronounced in syllables. Showing off his big vocabulary again, Luis thought. He looked closely at the bump, though. He felt bad about it. They look good, hee ho. Mr. Cintron made a sweeping gesture with his arms over the head. You know, all this will have to be classified. My dream is to have all the parts divided by year, make of car, and condition. Maybe now that you are here to help me, this will happen. Pop. Luis put his hand on his father's shoulder. They were the same height and build, about five foot six and muscular. The judge said six months of free labor for you. Not life, okay? Mr. Sintro nodded, looking distracted. It was then that Luis suddenly noticed how gray his hair had turned. It used to be shiny black like his own and that there were deep lines in his face. His father had turned into an old man, and he hadn't even noticed. Son, you must follow the judge's instructions. Like she said, next time you get in trouble, she's going to treat you like an adult. And I think you know what that means. Hard time. No breaks. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm doing, right? Working my hands to the bone instead of enjoying my summer. But listen, she didn't put me under house arrest, right? I'm going out tonight. Home by ten. She did say something about a curfew, Luis. Mr. Cintron had stopped smiling and was looking upset. It had always been hard for them to talk more than a minute or two before his father got offended at something Luis said, or at a sarcastic tone. He was always doing something wrong. Luis threw the rag down on the table and went to sit in his father's ancient Buick which was in mint condition. They drove home in silence. After sitting down at the kitchen table with his father to eat a pizza, they had picked up on the way home. Luis asked to borrow the car. He didn't get an answer then, just a look that meant, don't bother me right now. Before bringing up the subject again, Luis put some ice cubes in a baggie and handed it to Mr. Cintron, who had made the little bump on his head worse by rubbing it. It had guilty written on it, Luis thought. Gracias, hijo. His father placed the bag on the bump and made a face as the ice touched his skin. They ate in silence for a few minutes more. Then Luis decided to ask about the car again. I really need some fresh air, Pop. Can I borrow the car for a couple of hours? You don't get enough fresh air at the yard? We're lucky that we don't have to sit in a smelly old factory all day. You know that? Yeah, Pop. We're real lucky. Luis always felt irritated that his father was so grateful to own a junkyard. But he held his anger back and just waited to see if he'd get the keys without having to get in an argument. Where are you going? For a ride. Not going anywhere. Just out a while. Is that okay? His father didn't answer. He just handed him a set of keys, as shiny as the day they were manufactured. His father polished everything that could be polished. Doorknobs, coins, keys, spoons, knives, and forks. 
like he was King Midas counting his silver and gold. Luis thought his father must be really lonely to polish utensils only he used anymore. They had been picked out by his wife though, so they were like relics. Nothing she had ever owned could be thrown away. Only now, the dishes, forks, and spoons were not used to eat the yellow rice and red beans, the fried chicken, or the mouth-watering sweet plantains that his mother had cooked for them. They were just kept in the cabinets that his father had turned into a museum for her. Mr. Cintron could cook as well as his wife, but he didn't have the heart to do it anymore. Luis thought that maybe if they ate together once in a while, things might get better between them. But he always had something to do around dinner time and ended up at a hamburger joint. Tonight was the first time in months they had sat down at the table together. Luis took the keys. Thanks, he said, walking out to take his shower. His father kept looking at him with those sad, patient eyes. Okay, I'll be back by ten and keep the ice on that egg," Luis said without looking back. He had just meant to ride around his old burrito, see if any of the Tiburones were hanging out at the L building, where most of them lived. It wasn't far from the single-family home his father had bought when the business started paying off, a house that his mother lived in for three months before she took up residence at St. Joseph's Hospital. She never came home again. These days, Luis wished he still lived in that tiny apartment where there were always something to do, somebody to talk to. Instead, Luis found himself parked in front of the last place his mother had gone to, Ramirez Funeral Home. In the front yard was a huge oak tree that Luis remembered having climbed during the funeral to get away from people. The tree looked different now, not like a skeleton, as it had then, but green with leaves. The branches reached to the second floor of the house, where the family lived. For a while, Luis sat in the car allowing the memories to flood back into his brain. He remembered. His mother before the illness changed her. She had not been beautiful, as his father told everyone. She had been a sweet lady. Not pretty, but not ugly. To him, she had been the person who always told him that she was proud of him and loved him. She did that every night when she came to his bedroom door to say goodnight. As a joke, he would sometimes ask her, Proud of what? I haven't done anything. And she'd always say, I'm just proud that you are my son. She wasn't perfect or anything. She had bad days when nothing he did could make her smile, especially after she got sick. But he never heard her say anything negative about anyone. She always blamed El Destino, fate, for what went wrong. He missed her. He missed her so much. Suddenly a flood of tears that had been building up for almost three years started pouring from his eyes. Luis sat in his mother's car, with his head on the steering wheel, and cried, Mommy, I miss you. When he finally looked up, he saw that he was being watched. Sitting at a large window with a pad and a pencil on her lap was Naomi. At first Luis felt angry and embarrassed, but she wasn't laughing at him. Then she told him with her dark eyes that it was okay to come closer. He walked to the window, and she held up the sketch pad on which she had drawn him, not crying like a baby, but sitting on top of a mountain of silver discs, holding one up over his head. He had to smile. The plate glass window was locked. It had a security bolt on it. An alarm system, he figured, so nobody would steal the princess. He asked her if he could come in. It was soundproof too. He mouthed the words slowly for her to read his lips. She wrote on the pad, I can't let you in. My mother is not home tonight. So they looked at each other and talked through the window for a little while. Then Luis got an idea. He signed to her that he'd be back, and drove to the junkyard. Luis climbed up on his mountain of hubcaps. For hours he sorted the wheel covers by make, size, and condition, stopping only to call his father and tell him where he was and what he was doing. The old man did not ask him for explanations, and Luis was grateful for that. By lamppost light, Luis worked and worked, 
beginning to understand a little why his father kept busy all the time. Doing something that had a beginning, middle, and end did something to your head. It was like the satisfaction Luis got out of planning adventures for his tiburones. But there was another element involved here that had nothing to do with showing off for others. This was a treasure hunt, and he knew what he was looking for. Finally, when it seemed that it was a hopeless search, when it was almost midnight and Luis's hands were cut and bruised from his work, he found it. It was the perfect match for Naomi's drawing, the moon-shaped wheel cover for her car, Cinderella's shoe. Luis jumped off the small mound of discs left under him and shouted, Yes! He looked around and saw neat stacks of hubcaps that he would wash the next day. He would build a display wall for his father. People would be able to come into the yard and point to whatever they wanted. Luis washed the VW hubcap and polished it until he could see himself in it. He used it as a mirror as he washed his face and combed his hair. Then he drove to the Romero's funeral home. It was almost pitch black, since it was a moonless night. As quietly as possible, Luis put some gravel in his pocket and climbed the oak tree to the second floor. He knew he was in front of Naomi's window. He could see a shadow through the curtains. She was at a table, apparently writing or drawing, maybe waiting for him. Luis hung the silver disc carefully on the branch near the window, then threw the gravel at the glass. Naomi ran to the window and drew the curtains aside while Luis held on to the thick branch and waited to give her the first good thing he had given anyone in a long time. Alright, that is the end of Catch the Moon by Judith Ortiz Kofer. That was an amazing story. I love that a lot. This has been an audio recording by me, Jordan Barclay. Just doing this because I wanted to and a subscriber requested it. Once again, thank you Tala for requesting that. Had an amazing time. And if anyone liked the video of this production of this video, feel free to like it. I'd appreciate it. If you have any more requests, feel free to comment below. Like this story was great. And if you want to be updated on audio recordings like this, the subscribe button and the bell for notifications would be amazing to hit. Okay guys, I'll see you with another video soon. Until then. I'm out. Peace.